Hey, everybody. So tonight's program, we are, this is an MS Views and News program. If you don't know who MS Views and News are, well, then you don't know me. You've never seen me before. All right. But again, this is an MS Views and News program. We do educational programs around the country. This is our last in-person program of the year. This makes 38 in-person programs this year. Unbelievable. Yes. 180 nights on the road. That's more than half a year in case you can't figure that out. All right, tonight we had exhibitors. I know you all saw them out there. We had Alexion, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Novartis, and Sandoz. I'd like you all to give them a round of applause and say thank you. <laughs> Dr. Corkwood is one of the top MS experts in the country. He's also by trade first a neuro-ophthalmologist and then became an MS doctor, all right? So when he said that, he took over the Randy Shapiro MS Center. So Randy Shapiro is like one of the grandfathers of MS research and what he did for the MS community. And he is known by doctors all over the world for what he did. And when he asked Dr. Dr. Cockwood to take over his center, that was huge kudos for Dr. Cockwood. So this guy is doing a tremendous amount for the MS community, not just in the United States, but doctors from around the world hear what he's doing as well and the care that he's given for people with not just multiple sclerosis, but also NMO and other rare diseases. Dr. Cockwood, please start. Thanks everybody. Um, and, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Uh, let me get my setup to move the slide. So going to be talking to you about a few things. I'm Jonathan Colquitt. I run the uh, Minnesota Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Uh, formerly, we were the Shapiro Center. Randy Shapiro, uh, we have a long storied history in multiple sclerosis. Stuart referred to our, uh, uh, to our expertise in MS. And I say R because it takes a village to take care of someone with MS. It takes a team of individuals to care for people with MS. The disease is complicated. I'm going to talk to you about a few really cool things tonight that I'm passionate about. Um, Bob Shin, if you guys got a chance to see Bob, he's a friend of mine. Bob is also another neuro-ophthalmologist whose passion for optic nerve and his experience with patients with MS presenting with visual issues um, uh, caused him to be attracted to MS just in the same way that I was. So um, uh, Bob and I, and, and some of the biomarkers, uh, Bob Shin may have, may have even spoken about some of these I'm gonna talk to you about, uh, relate to uh, optic nerve. So um, got very topics for you tonight, um, but first and foremost is, is this is uh, biomarkers for MS in the management and diagnosis of MS. Now, it's confusing. We're gonna be throwing out a lot of words, a lot of terms, uh, biomarkers, disease, RNA, DNA, genes, all sorts of things, relapses. Yeah, the whole world is confusing. The world of MS is really challenging. It's getting more and more complicated. I'll try to make it simple, but some of this stuff is just pretty complex, but it's really cool. This is the cutting edge of some very important things coming along that are gonna help us take care of our patients. That's gonna help you with your disease to help understand. Uh, maybe even someday we're going to be able to identify who needs to be on what treatment before we have to try it out first and see if it works whole new world coming. So biomarkers are the leading edge of that. So what is a biomarker? Biomarker in a simplistic is a biological measurement of some type of indicator about the disease process, some way to monitor or detect the disease. Uh, and, and we can use them to, to manage and manage treatments. So first of all, uh, monitoring disease biomarkers can measure inflammation, specific to MS, in, inflammation in the progression of disease. We can also use biomarkers uh, to monitor uh, and inform our decisions based on the monitoring of disease about whether our treatments are working. And as we're finding more and more biomarkers are being used in clinical trials of MS to help identify treatments earlier uh, that, that patients will respond to and work through the process of identifying a drug. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to develop a treatment for MS and many, many years. Biomarkers uh, have the potential and actually have been speeding up that process. I'm actually gonna talk to you about some biomarkers that I think you're gonna be familiar with. Here's an example. Some of these you probably already know. MRI, um, maybe not OCT, Anybody know EDSS, Extended, Expanded Disability Status Scale in MS? That's actually the neurologic exam that your neurologist does on you if you have MS. 
and um, taking it a step further, including some functional measures, uh, measures uh, that help uh, determine uh, well your neurological functioning. And this is used in clinical trials. In fact, that's the number one uh, uh, examination score used when we're testing out new drugs for MS. So I'm going to talk about all of these. Bob Shin would be very familiar, just as I am, with optical coherence tomography, or OCT. Uh, low contrast acuity. I'll go through some of this in, in greater detail. Oligoclonal bands. Anybody who's had a spinal tap? Maybe a few of you had one or two. Hopefully only one. Um, uh, lumbar puncture. We're looking for proteins in the spinal fluid. Oligoclonal bands. We've known about this protein marker in the spinal fluid for decades, and we use it to help diagnose MS. Now, proteonomics is new, so we'll spend a little bit more time on, on discussing prote uh, proteonomics. So let's first of all talk about a little bit about the immune system. We have to understand the immune system a bit uh, to understand biomarkers. Uh, so first of all, the immune system is a complex. Uh, the adaptive immune system is, is the part of the immune system that is most important to MS. The adaptive immune system is composed of the helper cells, the T cells, the B cells. You know, I don't think too many people knew about T cells and B cells before COVID, but we started hearing a whole lot about T cells, a whole lot about the immune system since COVID. T cells are important for COVID. They're also very important in uh, the immune attack on the central nervous system that people with MS must endure. So the adaptive immune system is what most of our MS treatments work on. We do have a new class of drug coming along. I'll mention a little bit later, uh, uh, BTK inhibitors, uh, affect a different aspect of the immune system, the innate immune system, but currently the adaptive immunity is, is where our treatments are effective. We also have to think about this disease as it impacts primarily the central nervous system, the brain, optic nerve, and spinal cord is central nervous system. You may have tingling in your foot, but if you have tingling in your leg or your foot, it's not coming from your leg or your foot. It's not even coming from the nerves in your low back, like a pinch nerve if you hurt your low back, lifting something heavy, for example, uh, tingling in MS is coming from the spinal cord. Although the symptom may be similar to a neuropathy, um, and sometimes we use that word neuropathy, it really isn't the same. Then we have to understand the brain activity, the immune activity going on in the brain, brains of persons with MS. So we'll, we'll talk more about each and every one of these. Now, this is a schematic of what a normal, healthy nervous system should look like. You see a neuron, that neuron is connected locally to other neurons, and then you see the axon of that neuron and the myelin sheath. The myelin is the insulation on the wire, if you will, of the neuron. The neuron uh, sends and receives information through that axon and then communicates to other neurons uh, through uh, those the connections to the local uh, uh, environment. Now, when we have MS, we get something like this. So what you see here, I'm gonna go back, nice and clean. You don't see any other cells here. All these are nerve cells that you see right now. Now you see all kinds of things, B cells, T cells, macrophages, those little dots are chemical messengers of the immune system, uh, chemokines, cytokines. That's how the immune system calls in these immune cells that come in and attack the myelin. You can also see that the myelin is damaged and stripped and injured. Um, and, these, and this is the whole process that is going on inside of your brains. And this is what we want to stop. Now, how, uh, how does MS affect the central nervous system? How does, it, how, how does it damage things? So you see in this schematic, a nerve cell, then the myelin gets damaged. Now, we've known this as a demyelinating disease for decades, um, century or more, actually. We've known that MS demyelinates nerves. It wasn't as clear until recently that it also kills nerves. So if you demyelinate a nerve, as you see in that third lower panel, um, the nerve can actually transect. Once that nerve breaks, that nerve is dead and gone forever. It cannot recover. It never will recover. And unlike other cells in our body, once a nerve cell is dead and gone, it doesn't grow back. So a nerve cell really is gone forever, unfortunately. So how do we detect MS before we get to this stage, before nerve cells are dying off? Or how do we tell if uh, the treatment is working? And, and I'll draw your, draw your attention to this, this note. Time equals brain. 
tie. Brain cells are gradually going away in almost everybody with MS faster than aging. That's even when we appear to be completely controlling the disease, completely suppressing it, i.e. no relapses, your MRIs aren't changing, your neurologic exams are, change, are, are staying the same. Our research has shown that even in that situation, many people are losing brain cells faster than aging, sometimes two, three, four, five times faster than aging, and that's not that unusual. So ideally, we'd like to identify and change this before it's a problem. So if we can be doing fine and not know it, how do we know if our treatment's working? Back to some of those things I was talking about, those biomarkers. Now, this is something I say to neurologists often. As, as the neurologist taking care of someone with MS, it's like driving the bus of MS while we're looking in the rearview mirror. What that really means is we are always responding to something that has already happened to you. So once you have a relapse, you have nerve cells that have already died. Uh, if you have a change in your neurologic exam or even a change on the MRI, which you might not have felt, nerve cells died. So, and nerve cells, uh, uh, again, as I said, cannot be replaced. They're very, very precious. So I'm um, going to skip over this. This is really more about these various decision points, but just think there's a few way, few places where these decision points are going to be important. We initially diagnose, and that's a, a place where biomarkers may be important in the diagnosis of the disease. And we think as we are monitoring people along the way doing neurologic exams and MRIs, uh, that perhaps uh, uh, maybe things are going well, but um, uh, also a point where biomarkers might help us make a decision. Someone has breakthrough disease or a relapse, uh, biomarkers might be important to help us decide that. Uh, right down to something that has become a fairly hot topic recently is how long should we treat people with MS? If a person with MS uh, doesn't need treatment anymore, well, we'd like to know that before we stop the treatment and then they get, then get worse. These are places where biomarkers might help us in the journey of someone with MS. First biomarker, very familiar to you. Probably everyone here with MS, everyone in the audience has had um, an MRI scan, if not multiple. We see an image of a brain MRI and a spinal cord MRI. These are very, very sensitive markers, but they still don't tell us the whole story. We can scan your brain, so that's one biomarker. We're already pretty familiar with this one. What about OCT? OCT we're not as familiar with. So in the colorful image at the very bottom with the greens on it, what you're seeing there is the back of the eye, very high magnification, and it's it's that little area from the very, very back of your eye, and, and the, the colorful diagram on the chart is the layers of nerve cells. So with the layers of nerve cells, we see the retinal nerve fiber layer up here, ganglion cell layer, uh, and these are very important nerve cells. These, these nerve cells up here are the most important nerve cells to, to tell us uh, if your MS is being well controlled uh, or sometimes even use this to, di to diagnose MS. So um, uh, OCT basically stands for optical coherence tomography. It's a very easy thing to do, it takes a few minutes. Generally, it's done by ophthalmologists. Many ophthalmologists have this equipment readily in their office. Some MS centers also have this type of equipment in their office as well. So very important um, to keep this in mind that, that the rate of loss of the brain cells in the back of your eye, which are very accessible and measurable with OCT, can define whether you're responding to treatment, can help us diagnose whether you have MS, um, as well as to help uh, uh, determine maybe someday uh, if we, uh, when we start thinking about stopping treatment, is that an okay thing to do? So what are the advantages of OCT? Well, it's cheap. Um, it doesn't hurt. It's non-invasive. Uh, it takes a few minutes to do, and it, and it gives us very high resolution, a very detailed measurement of the back of the eye. We know how fast you should be changing due to aging. And if you're changing faster than aging, then that's a problem. And we, and we can use optical coherence tomography to identify that again before. So OCT is a powerful biomarker for MS diagnosis and management, provides valuable insight into the progression of the disease as well as other aspects. Uh, we can use OCT to, to, again, I mentioned even diagnose MS. Now, another readily available measure in your 
generally ophthalmologist's office, we do this in our MS center, something called contrast sensitivity. So the eye chart you see on the top here is actually a black letter against a white background. That would be fairly similar to the same type of um, uh, eye exam you would take if you go to your eye doctor. Only the chart, the typical Snellen chart is uh, not V-shaped like this. When you look at the, the Sloan low contrast acuity chart on the bottom, what you see is the letters are dim on a gray background. That actually turns out to be the most sensitive thing, uh, the, the sensitive measurement of someone who's had damage in their optic nerve due to MS. So contrast sensitivity, another readily available biomarker, easy to do, it's cheap, inexpensive, very sensitive, not as specific. Other things can affect OCT. If you get a cataract or something, or if your eyes are really dry, that can affect, uh, I'm sorry, I said OCT, I meant contrast. That can affect your contrast sensitivity. So while OCT is much more specific for nerve cell loss and nerve damage, uh, contrast can be affected by other things, but it is very, very sensitive. And if you have MS, it's a very important tool that your eye doctor or your neurologist could be using to help monitor your progress. Well, this is probably one of the newest and coolest things I'm going to talk about today. Um, unveiling the power of serum biomarkers in MS. We are on the cusp of a huge advancement in the world of MS. Our colleagues in the world of oncology have had biomarkers of oncologic disease for decades. They've been able to do various uh, genetic tests or measurements. Uh, in some cases, it's staging the cancer. And right down to then being able to tell what treatment someone is likely to respond to based on their individual type of cancer. We really don't have that in MS. In MS, we lump everybody together and, uh, and then try to tease it apart, but everybody with MS is different. So this is a new, very important cutting edge. Now, first one we had about five to seven years ago, really about three years, we've had a commercially available lab test for something called neurofilament light chain. So NFL light is a biomarker. It is a protein. If you see in the, in the schematic, that is a protein that belongs inside of your nerves. Well, it shouldn't be present in the spinal fluid or in the blood. It should be in your nerves. Now, we've known for decades that in persons with MS, we can measure elevated uh, neurofilament light chain in their spinal fluid. But it wasn't until recently that we had a test uh, for um, a neurofilament light chain that we could do on the blood. And now, as I mentioned, there's a commercially available blood test for neurofilament light chain um, that we can now order as a commercial panel and commercial labs. Um, now, neurofilament light chain, again, should be present in the blood. Um, we've known about in the spinal fluid. Uh, I think this points out a very important aspect of biomarkers. You can have a great biomarker, but if it is difficult to do or invasive in this case, prior to about five years ago, the only way we could tell if you had neurofilament light chain was to do a spinal tap. Mm, it's not exactly easy. It's uncomfortable. It's the doctor word for pain. We don't like to use the P word. We say it's uncomfortable. It's going to be a little skeeter bite, right? And we don't say it's going to hurt. No, spinal taps hurt, right? They just hurt. Um, and other things can go wrong. And it's also difficult to do. Um, so we now recently have this biomarker neurofilament light chain that we are able to then measure in a blood test. So very important that a biomarker be easy to do. If I say, hey, I really want to check your neurofilament light biomarker. Why don't you sign up on that sign up list for a spinal tap? Are you going to sign up? Maybe not. So uh, the biomarker has to be easy, it has to be cheap, has to be reproducible and very sensitive. So neurofilament light, very sensitive. Now it's much easier, a simple blood test can tell us. Now, spend a little more time on this. This is, uh, I actually just uh, screen capped this from a research presentation at the Actrams Forum meeting. Um, uh, this was a poster, a research presentation at that meeting. And this, uh, 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 lays out a biomarker. Uh, this is actually a panel of biomarkers. These are proteonomic biomarkers, multiple different proteins. And if you look at the little bubble chart there, uh, these proteins are involved in immune modulation, 
neuroinflammation, neuroaxonal integrity, that little schematic of nerve cells that were dying and, and falling apart. That's what neuroaxonal integrity means. And then myelin biology, whether myelin is being injured or damaged. So these 18 different proteins have been studied and we're able from these proteins to be able to identify uh, uh, inflammation. Again, these four elements that all, and this company uh, called Octave uh, uh, has developed this biomarker test uh, that is a single blood test. Um, you draw the blood right now, you can only get this test in about 30 or 40 MS centers around the country, but stay tuned, it's gonna gradually uh, become more and more readily available. Eventually insurance companies will start covering it. Uh, the uh, company that, uh, that developed the test um, uh, has um, uh, heavily subsidized the cost of the test. So uh, it is somewhat affordable, at least for most people. So this is something you could do now even uh, if you can get access to the test. But again, it's only available in about 30 or 40 MS centers, but stay tuned, it's coming. So here's a little bit larger example in showing you the different proteins. And some of these proteins actually wind, uh, they overlap in different spheres. So the bubble diagram there kind of shows how the proteins overlap. I uh, hope everyone's paying attention. There's gonna be a quiz at the end. We're gonna ask you what all these are. No, it was a joke, no quiz. Um, Stuart might ask you some questions. Now this is what you get at the end. You get a disease activity report. So MS disease activity report. Now right now, this inflammate, this primarily, these, these protein biomarkers primarily measure inflammation. So inflammation in the, um, in, in those, uh, it, um, inflammation loosely translates to the chance of having a relapse or making a new or new active lesion on the MRI scan. So um, these biomarkers, uh, or this is actually the report that you get. And uh, if you, if you look at the, um, the image over uh, on the left side, you'll see these little dots uh, up and down. And so this will measure the series over time. So we could do this panel uh, repeatedly over time. So typically we would do this as an example, maybe before we start you on an MS treatment and then repeat the test a few months later uh, down the road if we suspect that something may be changing or just routinely check it to see if the inflammation is staying under control. So this is going to be a huge, uh, huge benefit for us is now. I'm using it on, on my patients in the um, Minnesota Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Uh, currently, we are one of the centers able to do this test currently. And I'm very excited about this becoming more, much more widely available. And uh, I think probably we're hoping next year in the fall, mid-year, maybe back half of the year, that one of our big insurers in Minnesota, Blue Cross, is going to start covering this test. Uh, so that will be a big step forward. So for the time being, stay tuned if you do have access to an MS center. Um, but I think more and more, this test will be developed further and further, and pretty soon you'll be able to get it outside of MS centers as well. Huh. Yeah, a lot of words. Uh, OCT, MS, diagnosis, multiple sclerosis, outcomes, outcomes, conclusions, limitation. It's very confusing. The world is really, really confusing. Well, we have a few things. I'm going to shift gears now. We have a few things to talk about, a few more things to talk about. I actually have to apologize to Stuart. Um, uh, Stuart, the title of your uh, uh, of this presentation, I kind of messed up. We, you, Stuart and I talked about a couple of presentations, and um, one of those were new and emerging treatments. Uh, well, I got my wires crossed and um, with Stuart, and in fact, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going a little faster because I tacked on a little um, something to compensate for the fact that I forgot to put a presentation together on new and emerging treatments, but I'm gonna show you something cool at the end. So I'm gonna shift gears now to talk about something that we really need to be aware of right now. And that's, uh, we really need to understand the world of biosimilar uh, drugs. Um, so if we go back to the old days of um, the mess when we only had a couple of drugs, uh, um, uh, we've come a long way. We have many, many treatments now. Biological drugs for MS really uh, well, biological drugs were really our first successful drugs. Biological drugs are difficult to make. They're a real challenge, uh, uh, much, much, uh, much more difficult than a small molecule drug like a typical uh, Tylenol or aspirin or a, a, a blood pressure or medication or something like that. Um, so biosimilar drugs get a very long patent half-life. Uh, so the FDA uh, 
when they approve a drug, allows a company to a drug company to recoup the costs they spend in developing uh, the treatment. And because biological drugs were so so difficult to um, to develop and so costly, the FDA allowed the patent life to extend for many years. Um, but we are now seeing some of our biological drugs coming off patent and biosimilar drugs are being developed. Uh, and uh, we, our first biosimilar drug was a copolymer one biosimilar, biosimilar for copaxone. Um, and we now just recently had a, another biosimilar for uh, uh, natalizumab, Tysabri, uh, was just recently F, uh, approved by the FDA in September. So what are biosimilar drugs? Well. They're, they're safe, they're effective. Um, they're available for many diseases, not just MS. Uh, and uh, I'd like to go through a little bit of this. Now, I'm gonna have to practice my IT skills here because we ran into a little problem here and that this little video from the FDA I wanna show you didn't play when I wanted it to. Similar, sorry. So I'm no, gonna try to make to it. A range of conditions like chronic skin and bowel diseases, arthritis, diabetes, kidney conditions, macular degeneration, and some cancers. You may have been prescribed a biosimilar, but you aren't quite sure why or what a biosimilar even is. So let's break it down. A biosimilar is a type of biologic medication, and most biologic medications are made from living sources, like animal cells, bacteria, or yeast. Because they mostly come from living sources, all types of biologics have minor differences that occur naturally between production batches. This makes most biologics more complicated to produce than drugs made from chemicals. Different from most biologics, most drugs, like aspirin, are made from chemicals and involve a simpler process to be produced, and they generally can be more easily copied. So where do biosimilars fit in? Well, because of those minor differences, a biosimilar is very similar, but not identical to an original biologic already approved by the FDA. Just like brand name drugs have generic versions, original biologics can have biosimilars. And as with generics, biosimilars can be made by multiple companies using publicly available data from the original biologic to help support approval. This results in more options for patients at potentially more competitive prices. Now, that doesn't mean that biosimilars aren't as safe or effective as the original biologic. In fact, it's just the opposite. The FDA's careful review of data, studies, and tests helps to ensure that biosimilars provide the same treatment benefits as the original FDA approved. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Technology such as it is. They are both made from the same types of living sources. They are given at the same strength and dosage, and both are given in the same way. Plus, to be approved by the FDA, studies must show that the biosimilar is not expected to have any new or worsening side effects as compared to the original biologic. Biosimilars may provide you with more access to important treatments, and they may also save you money, depending on your insurance coverage. Many different biosimilars have been approved, and more are expected. The FDA wants to make sure patients and caregivers know about biosimilars so they understand all of the potential treatment options. To learn more, visit fda.gov slash biosimilars. So let's talk a little bit um, about, uh, so in general, the expectations and here what we can think about the future of biosimilar drugs. Um, uh, they're available for many conditions. They're really making a big difference in the world of MS currently. Um, and uh, uh, they're, uh, as far as cost, uh, um, we're going to talk a bit more about this, but these are the, these are the key, key measures. So they are very similar to the original biological compound. Um, they offer an increased affordability. And uh, as we'll see, the insurance companies, uh, well, we know that they like generic drugs, they definitely like uh, biosimilar drugs too in a similar way. So uh, safety and effectiveness, very similar between biosimilars. Again, as, as the video mentioned, there are really, really significant differences 
um, uh, even in the same batch. Uh, there's a lot of quality control that goes into to monitoring these biological drugs. Each, each batch of a biological drug can be slightly different. So even uh, in, a, in a trade name, like a trade name Tysabri, um, the batch control is really important. The same thing with the, with the uh, biosimilar biological drugs, very important. And the FDA, as part of their evaluation process, also evaluates very tightly the manufacturing process to make sure that there's consistency between batches as well. So um, uh, we, we, have, we proved similar safety and efficacy in biosimilar drugs. This is done in clinical trials. It's done in both um, uh, regulatory approval and bench research and real world experience. Biosimilars offer cost savings over and above the parent com compound. So huge potential benefit to improve access to treatments for persons uh, with MS to some of these biological therapies. Mentioned lower cost, it increases competition in the marketplace, can further lower cost, uh, provide more treatment options, and again, Insurance plans uh, uh, might limit access in some cases, uh, but might be more likely to cover a, bio, a uh, biosimilar drug. So if we can improve access to treatments, that's a win and win all around. So when we're switching from the reference drug, now the reference drug is considered the original biological drug. Often we have to have a reason, um, usually, um, uh, the reason we would use, well, let's just look at this, who decides? So um, there's, there are basically three sources of that decision um, that uh, essentially biosimilar drugs, uh, the decision to change your treatment to a biosimilar drug may be made by your healthcare provider. That might be based on whether you're having side effects or something, may be made by your insurance company. They change their formulary when a cheaper drug becomes available and they make that, that the preference. And ultimately, it might be your choice if there's more out-of-pocket cost to you uh, on one or one of or the other drugs. So in general, we urge that you talk to your healthcare provider about this, have a conversation. Your healthcare provider should be knowledgeable uh, and the FDA backs up uh, that these drugs are similar and that you can make these uh, transitions um, uh, safely uh, and with still maintaining good control of your MS. There are uh, state laws on point to this about any automatic substitutions, but that varies uh, state by state. So that's something uh, that you may not be familiar with and your doctors may not be familiar with, but this is a process that is governed at a state level. All right, all of these factors I think we covered and spoke about, um, safety, efficacy, cost, uh, patient preference, doctor recommendation, availability, and essentially in summary, these are the advantages of biosimilar drugs. Like it or not, they are coming and um, we will have to deal with biosimilars, but we shouldn't be afraid of them. In fact, if anything, it's gonna help. All right, gonna shift gears, make sure I have enough. I think I have, hmm, Stuart, I'm gonna try to stay under the wire so we can have enough time for questions, but. Here is what I decided to do. Stuart and I talked about this. Um, new and emerging treatments in MS. There's a few things we can talk about. I think something that's been emerging for quite some time is cannabinoids and the use in multiple sclerosis. So cannabinoids in MS, um, we've had quite a lot of research on this recently, at least what relative to cannabinoids. In general, cannabinoids have been illegal federally for, for so long that um, the uh, um, uh, uh, we don't have that much research, but in the European countries and in Canada, there's been a fair amount of research done in MS, and they're actually approved cannabinoid therapies first in Canada and Europe uh, to treat uh, symptoms of MS. Now, right now, we have to think about cannabinoids as treatments for the symptoms of the disease. Um, we haven't proven that they affect the immune system although there is reason to believe they might, that's not proven yet. Um, so I think as we, as, uh, as we begin to do more research on cannabinoids in MS, I think we're gonna find uh, more and more research that's gonna be focused on whether they have an impact on actually slowing down the disease. They definitely, we have proof now of their effectiveness in various treatments uh, uh, as, a, as a treatment for symptoms. Now, um, I'm gonna have to try to, 
Uh, this is another video that didn't play, so I'm going to try to move this one over. And Now, uh, preface this by saying I'm not going to make this full screen because that was my problem last time. I'll preface this by saying one of the reasons that we don't have cannabinoid research has a lot to do with what went on back in the day. Ah, um, I, I think I'm just going to bag it. <laughs> too, too much technology uh, wins. But this was the original trailer for, uh, you can look this up on YouTube. It's quite funny, uh, Reefer Madness. There was a movie in the, in the uh, 40s uh, about reefer madness. We thought that cannabinoids were these terrible things that would cause people to just uh, literally commit murder, um, make people crazy and do all, all, all sorts of crazy things. Um, and that's just really not the case. So um, what I'd like to talk about now is um, more, a little more detail. Um, medical cannabis and cannabinoids, there's a long history. I'll go through some of this. Uh, this is just an overview of, of, of cannabinoids in general. So um, uh, 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 illegal at a federal level, legal in many states, uh, um, and many states that don't have recreational programs uh, have uh, therapeutic programs for cannabis. So we have uh, basically two types of, uh, of cannabinoids that we'll discuss that have been studied the most. There are hundreds of different cannabinoids that we still need to learn about. So we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through, but this is kind of the overview, and then I have a few recommendations at the end. So uh, over a million people in, in, in the U.S. with MS, we know this is an autoimmune disease, as we discussed before, and the common symptoms that we see in MS related to demyelination of the spinal cord, um, and there are other pain syndromes related to brain demyelination. Uh, limb spasticity, pain, and bladder symptoms are probably the three symptomatic issues that people with MS have where cannabinoids can be quite helpful. Uh, again, treating the symptoms. We don't know that they slow down the disease. At least we don't know that yet. We have evidence going back to the Neolithic period um, uh, where that cannabinoid pollen, cannabis pollen, was found uh, uh, in grave sites, we think it was used ritualistically then. Uh, the ancient Greeks used it as part of their uh, medicinal system. And uh, the 8th through the 18th centuries in the Islamic world, uh, there's evidence of it being used to treat epilepsy, nausea, pain, and fever. Chinese medicine in 100 AD uh, used it in surgical anesthetic. If we look more recently, more modern history, 1830s, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy uh, uh, did the first human research uh, and in the late 19th century, uh, uh, we developed uh, additional research was done, but then it became illegal and, and we see the research pretty much dropped off. But we did find evidence of its impact on glaucoma and spasticity as early as the 1950s. Um, and and uh, there's still now we're starting, as I mentioned before, starting to see an even a bigger increase uh, in uh, research now in 1937. Uh, it was uh, made uh, illegal. Uh, cannabis research was still permitted at that time. In 1970, the Controlled Substance Act stopped that. Essentially, cannabis research stopped at that point. Uh, California uh, was, was the first to lead the way in uh, adopting a medical use program. And uh, now we're uh, coming along as various states have, have been uh, integrating and developing their own cannabis, uh, cannabis programs. So cannabinoids in general are derived from the plant cannabis sativa. It's native to Central Asia. There are different types of, of cannabis uh, sativa, uh, different, different uh, 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 species of cannabis. There's loosely chem chemicals that bind to a cannabinoid receptor in the body. We have an endocannabinoid system in our body that cannabinoids respond to. We have receptors in our body that, that um, and there's a system in our body that uses cannabinoids. I'll show you that. Uh, in a minute, but the uh, types of cannabinoids we see, cannabinoids, terpenoids, flavonoids, um, phytocannabinoids, and the endocannabinoid system. Now, there's a lot of big words here. Um, Marinol, uh, epileodex, there's a couple of other uh, uh, therapies now approved that are actually medical treatments that are synthetic cannabinoids. And more and more, we're seeing uh, other, uh, uh, other development and other research. So THC and CBD are probably the two most common um, cannabinoids that we see, at least in medical programs. And they're two we know the most about, although 
We don't know very much about any of them. In most uh, um, native cannabis plants, you're going to see THC dominate. Um, strains typically have anywhere from up to 24% THC, but low CBD. Um, hemp, hemp, uh, hemp's become a very popular uh, agricultural product. Hemp has very, very uh, small concentrations of THC in it, very, very high concentrations of cannabidiol, CBD. Uh, so hemp is actually legal in many states and was uh, uh, legalized uh, in many states well before uh, cannabinoids um, uh, were uh, legal. So THC and CBD, essentially, if we start looking at the, the therapeutic aspects, THC in general uh, has its greatest effect on pain and, and nausea. Um, now, there's overlap between THC and CBD. While we, while we see CBD uh, tends to be even more effective on pain, it's a little more sedating, may help you with sleep, um, and spasticity in general, uh, THC tends to work a little bit better for spasticity than CBD does. Um, as we've developed these medical programs, though, we're not reliant upon just having um, a leaf product or growing the cannabis or, you know, finding a college kid to get it or however you get it when it's illegal. Um, so uh, we really have learned that we can blend different proportions uh, and pure CBD, which is legal in many states, isn't going to be as effective on pain, sedation as it would be. Um, if you add a little bit of THC. So 10% THC makes the CBD work a lot better and vice versa. So uh, if, if THC, if you need THC more for, uh, for uh, the spasticity effects, uh, then uh, a little adding some CBD to the THC helps the THC part work better. So they potentiate each other's effect is the medical term for that. So we have a lot of different types of cannabis. The, the leaf actually has very low concentrations of THC and CBD in it. Uh, the flower uh, has the most or the highest concentration. And then if we look at these little tiny trichomes uh, that sit on the surface of the flower leaves, you can kind of see them in the, in the uh, middle image there uh, magnified. That's where your highest concentration of both THC and CBD is going to be. Now, this is a very complex diagram. I'm not going to go through all of it. If I could hear, there's probably a sigh of relief. Um, but what I want to show you, is what this diagram is, is a very complicated system. These are, this is the endocannabinoid system in a nerve cell. So what you're seeing here is where two nerve cells connect to each other and transmit information. So essentially what happens with cannabinoids, they are... <clears throat> Cannabinoids have this immediate effect if the nerve cell that is receiving overstimulation, if that nerve, if one nerve, when one nerve connects to another in something called a synapse, um, normally uh, that's how you would propagate something. Let's say, uh, you know, your brain tells your foot to move. So it has to go through a series of different nerves and each nerve has to communicate with the next nerve. So this is two nerves communicating with each other. If the nerve is being overstimulated, if the receiving nerve is being overstimulated, as soon as the transmitting nerve receives cannabinoids, it immediately shuts down that overstimulation. It's almost immediate. Um, so that seems to be where some or a lot of the effects occur in MS, uh, certainly on pain. If you can understand a nerve that's overstimulating another nerve, and causing, uh, 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 causing a pain signal to be transmitted, uh, and you immediately reduce that overstimulation, you're going to reduce pain. So uh, that's probably about as simplistic an explanation as I can come up with um, to, to explain kind of how cannabinoids work. They immediately reduce the release of those chemicals that are crossing from one nerve to the other, and that down-regulates the transmission of the painful stimulus or the overstimulation of the spasticity. We know that there are receptors in your brain for these nerves, receptors all over your body, in fact, that they're higher up in your brain in the cortex. This is probably where 
We find the effects of cannabis on sedation, the calming effects and the effects on sleep. Um, the presynaptic transmission, that second bullet point there under cortex, is what I showed you in the diagram. Hippocampus, there, there are receptors there. That's where your memory is. We know these drugs can, inter can interfere with memory trafficking as well. And in the spinal cord, they suppress the pain signaling and the overstimulation. So these are where some of the treatments work. Now, this is really interesting, and this might be where the future lies as we look into do cannabinoids, could they have an effect on suppressing the disease itself of MS, make you less likely to have a relapse or less likely to have damaged nerve cells? Well, we know that B cells, which are directly or rather indirectly involved in MS, um, that B cells are suppressed and, they, and their B cell migration and the activation, key, key um, steps in how MS elaborates, uh, that cannabinoids suppress that, although we haven't proven that effect in living people with MS. We also know that T cells have receptors on their surface for cannabinoids and that CBD2 receptor stimulation uh, that's that's uh, CBD2 receptor is one of the receptors that's part of your body. Uh, so that receptor stimulation, um, uh, uh, cannabinoids reduce that and and uh, and have some effect on the immune system. So at this at this point, uh, we have suspicion that they might help MS in other ways. But right now we have proof that they do help manage the symptoms of the disease. So. It's not without some, some downsides. Cannabis can have some downsides. So cannabis use disorder. Cannabis use disorder, well, you would loosely call that uh, uh, addiction. Uh, someone who really becomes uh, physically or emotionally dependent upon uh, cannabis. Um, and that is a potential, a potential issue. There is another issue called hyperemesis syndrome. Happens in the Minnesota medical program. It's about 8% of people can develop um, uh, uh, severe uh, intractable nausea and vomiting, uh, even with just their, uh, just a little bit of cannabis. So there is a downside. If those folks get that particular issue, they have to be really careful. Cannabis may not be a useful uh, treatment for them. A motivational syndrome. Uh, you may not want to do a whole lot if you're high on cannabis. Again, CBD compounds don't have as much of that effect. It's the THC side. We've known for a while that um, uh, schizoaffective disorders, schizophrenia-like things are more common in cannabis users. And there is some concern that cannabis could trigger schizophrenic events, uh, hence the Reefer Madness video I wasn't really able to show you, unfortunately. Um, reproductive issues, um, yes, they may have some impact uh, on, on uh, human reproduction, um, uh, conception, uh, um, uh, fertility. Uh, uh, male uh, reduces uh, sperm count in men primarily. So those are some of the downside we need to keep uh, keep in mind. Now, I think I just want to kind of talk through this part, and I imagine there might be some questions on this. A couple things we need to think about. Smoking has some neg negative impacts on your body. We can now vape, uh, but smoking is the fastest way to get your blood level of cannabis up quickly. So vaporizing or smoking cannabis will have a peak effect from the cannabis within seconds, it appears in your bloodstream. Within a minute or two, we're seeing almost peak effects uh, of, of the cannabis when we dose cannabis in this particular way. Various different um, amounts are necessary. If someone has a tolerance to cannabis, they'll be able to start with higher doses. Someone who's naive to cannabis should start with a very low dose. Um, oral ingestion does something interesting. If you take it by mouth, just like, like a pill where you swallow it and just it goes right straight into the stomach, um, then those cannabinoids have to pass through your liver. And as it passes through the liver, it breaks down into a very long acting form, which means it's very much slower in onset. It lasts a lot longer, um, but the peak onset will be, oh, 30 minutes, really more like two, three, four hours. And some effects may even last up to 24 hours. Uh, another way to get cannabis in your body um, is absorbing it through the lining of your mouth. So drops, oils, sprays, tinctures, various things available in medical programs, uh, gummies, uh, all sorts of things are available. Um, you don't really want to swallow those things like a gummy, 
Uh, some people chew them up and swallow them. Uh, I, I tell my patients, you want to chew up the gummy and then sort of like put it in your cheek, like it's snuff or something. You want it up against your mucous membranes. You want it to slowly, you want the cannab cannabinoids to slowly leach out and then be absorbed through the lining of your mouth and the lining of your esophagus. Um, now, in general, we need to be aware of these different effects of the different ways you take cannabis a little beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about. And um, we don't really know that much about it from our science is what are the best ways to use cannabis therapeutically in an individual? I generally recommend that my treatment naive patient on cannabinoids start with what's called a 50-50 or one-to-one -one concentration of CBD to THC. So if we're dealing with something like spasticity, uh, or pain management, what we're trying to address is we start off with roughly equal proportions. If you get high from the THC, then we'll shift that around. We will we will change uh, we will change that, um, and um, uh, we will change change that out. Uh, uh, there's a lot uh, a lot that we have to do, uh, and a lot more that we have to learn. So varying different concentrations varying the milligram amounts and varying the ways that it is that it enters into the body all can have different therapeutic effects so if you've tried cannabis uh, medical or otherwise and you haven't gotten the therapeutic effect as long as you didn't have the hyperemesis syndrome or one of these other issues um, then you might don't be turned off on it because there might be a way to use it therapeutically. So uh, as we learn more and more, uh, we're gonna find more and more availability of resources for, for people. I've learned a lot from my patients who just experiment with things, but we're now, we very soon will have uh, research on cannabis that is really gonna help us. Uh, one of my former nurse practitioners is going to be certified as the first cannabinoid nurse practitioner in all of Minnesota. I think she finishes her training coming up in April of this year. So we will be doing more and more on this. And hopefully, Stuart, one of these days, we can do a program uh, that is more detailed on this and help people really understand how cannabinoids can help them in their day to day. With that said, Stuart, you win. I ran over. I'm sorry. You owe me money. Uh, six minutes. <laughs> you owe me a joint. Six minutes. You owe me a joint. Let's go. Let's get started. <laughs> Can't do that yet in Minnesota. <laughs> when we meet in a legal state. <laughs> All right, thank you. Everybody thank doctor for speaking tonight. Yes, thank you. So unfortunately he did not have time to speak about what I really wanted him to speak about. So if anybody's got questions about any of the multiple sclerosis medications out there, anything, he can answer this now. We're gonna do 30 minutes yep. of Q&A. You wanna talk about pot, we can talk about pot. I actually feel like I wanna go outside I'm and get a... high right now, although I haven't done this in a very <laughs> long time, all right? Um, <laughs> let's see, what else? Uh, you spoke about the biosimilars. So the biosimilars are emerging therapies. We are hoping to see more of that in the very near future. So who's got the first question? Come on, everybody, don't be scared. Who's got the first question? Thank you. I'll be back there in a minute. I hold the mic, sorry. One germ mic, mine. Works for me. Uh, hi, I have a question. I don't have MS, my husband does, but I have essential tremors and neuropathy. Would the uh, cannabis help with that? Well, you know, um, in, in general, I think my experience with my patients in the trimmer is that while, while trimmer isn't one of those uh, treatments under the Minnesota, uh, approved on the Minnesota medical program, um, trimmer, especially essential trimmer, uh, and again, I, 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 I'm not giving you medical advice in this situation. This is my experience with my patients. Um, when I have a patient with essential trimmer, because essential trimmer is very sensitive to anxiety um, uh, and cannabinoids can kind of, well, CBD especially can kind of lessen anxiety. So if I were to use cannabinoids in one of my patients who had an essential trimmer, I would go much higher on the CBD side and lower THC. Um, the THC can actually increase anxiety. But in general, no, it wouldn't be considered a typical or usual uh, medical treatment for, for trimmer. Uh, but in my experience with my patients, I have had some patients with essential trimmer uh, where we used cannabinoids for another indication and it did help their essential trimmer. 
So I do have anecdotal experience with my patients on that. It might. Thank you. Next question. My question has to do with the biosimilars. And my, I'm just sharing that my initial reaction is dismay. Because in my, in my husband's experience, we had financial assistance with the brand name drugs. So I feel yeah. like the, in, there's a very strong potential for insurance to hijack the p patient's choice of medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, or, do you have a question or would you like me to address that concern or? Um... I heard a positive spin from from your presentation on the biosimilars as an option but i i was going to say so well, so how can you cons well, if, console me <laughs> yeah yeah I, you know i can't um um from the perspective of uh, uh biosimilars are here and for all of those major pressures uh cost primarily uh access to care uh that is driven by restriction to access because of the cost of these biological drugs, um, whether we like it or not, it's here. So um, uh, what we have to understand is we're going to have to deal with it because the in, the decision for uh, uh, a uh, biosimilar is not necessarily going to be yours. Um, the decision is more likely going to come from the insurance company. Now, uh, I will say that while the uh, biosimilar for Copaxone did not come with financial support. Um, my understanding is that the biosimilar for anatolizumab um, is going to come with some financial support, uh, as well as that company is developing a, uh, a JC virus testing program, which would be very important for them to do. That's really important to manage the, uh, the main risk of uh, Tysabri, the brain infection PML, driven by the JC virus. So we need to monitor that JC virus. So generic Tysabri or natalizumab, generic natalizumab is going to be, or, or rather I should say biosimilar natalizumab, um, apparently is going to have some kind of copay support and a JC virus testing program, at least uh, is what I've been informed uh, at this point. So hopefully that will soften some of the forced transitions that are likely to occur. And there might be, instances where you might think about a biosimilar a transition to a biosimilar yourself, they are slightly different. So if someone were having, oh, infusion reactions with natalizumab, not uh, Tysabri, uh, 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 maybe they might not as much with a different drug that is maybe slightly, uh, slightly different. Um, but primarily, I think that decision, you're right, is going to be driven by uh, uh, finances and insurance companies. And while I too, am not terribly pleased about them making medical decisions for my patients. The FDA is working hard to try to assure that the drugs are very similar in their effectiveness and side effect profiles. So doctor, just to add to that, I've been on the ad board for Tyruco, which is the natalizumab biosimilar. And as of yet, they don't even have a cost basis of what they're gonna be using right. for this drug yet. So they did no. say that if it turns out to be that it would be an expensive drug, then yes, they would have a patient assistance program. But if it's gonna be a lower end drug, like a generic, then it won't have a, pi a, a patient assistance program. And that works, anybody that knows patient assistance programs, that only works really well if you're on a private insurance, not on Medicare or Medicaid. If you're on Medicare right. or Medicaid, you're banned from any of these programs, which is a big, which is the biggest problem. And that's, and that's what I bring up to all the pharmaceuticals all the time, is what are you gonna do for all of those that are on Medicare or Medicaid? And if I could come up with an answer with them, y'all would be the first to know, all right? Thank you. You're, you're right, Stuart. That's a that's a very important point. That 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 the the most disenfranchised in our in our healthcare system, people on government funded insurance plans, are the ones who can't get access to those copay benefits uh, simply because of a uh, legislative uh, rules. Thank you. Next. Um, hello. So I was wondering. It sounded like biomarkers are going to be used a lot in diagnosis, but I was wondering, like, because you mentioned the test that you do, and it'll show you, like, how would that benefit someone like me? Great question. Well, I, th I think biomarkers are going to be uh, used well beyond, and actually diagnosis is probably not where 
not where they're being used the most right now. I think um, monitoring uh, uh, patients with the biomarkers that we currently have, I would say, um, uh, uh, monitoring uh, response to treatment is probably the number one usefulness of them currently. I, I think as they grow and develop uh, and we learn more and more, we're going to be using, um, I'm not even sure these proteinomic biomarkers will be the ones, the ones I showed you are the ones we're going to be using to diagnose the disease. It ultimately, I think where we're headed is going to be similar to where oncology is, where we're able to measure uh, a genetic uh, assessment. We know of 57 genes uh, already that are involved in MS. A recent one was discovered recently in a, a group of patients who seem to have primarily cognitive problems. So as we learn more and more about the genetics of MS, uh, I can foresee a time where we'll be able to do a blood test, assess, it may not be a blood test, we might scrape the skin on the end of your mouth, uh, inside of your mouth, uh, um, and be able to do a genetic test that will not only tell us whether you have MS, but based on your genetic makeup, uh, might even tell us what treatments you might respond to, or hopefully what cures we might need to implement. I do use the word cure because I'm seeing that more and more as a possibility as, as this science further develops. So um, yeah, I too am hopeful. Uh, where they help us right now, not very much, um, but incrementally adding to our understanding um, and now having an ability to measure inflammation in these four different spheres or, or problems in these four different spheres before a patient has a relapse. Identify someone who's at greater risk of worsening before they make a new lesion on the scan or before they have permanent loss of, of nerve cells. Um, and then I think the other place they're gonna be useful is um, when is it maybe time to not treat someone with MS? We've spent many, many decades studying when to put somebody on treatment, but very little time studying do people need to be treated their whole lives? Should we take people off treatment? It appears that some people may not need to be treated when they're older, but we can't tell who those people are ahead of time. This is where these biomarkers even are likely to help us very soon. Thank you for that. And from a patient's perspective, me. All right. So I've been on many ad boards. Ad boards are advocacy boards, all right? And um, I've been on this with the different pharmaceuticals that have these biomarkers coming out. And I am really glad to know that there is something out there that's going to say, hey, your medication is not going to be working for you in six months from now or a year from now. All right, so if I had to get a blood test for this, and that's gonna determine that I should get off what I'm on currently because the prognosis is that's gonna stop working for me, then yes, I only want that damn little blood test. All right, so the, 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 what they're doing is really good, and a lot of people see this as just another way for pharmaceutical to make money. Actually, it's not. It's a way for you all to spend less. If you know what's going on and it keeps you out of the damn hospital, then it's going to cost you less. All right? So just look at it like that as well. We have a new question over here. You don't get the mic like everybody else. <laughs> so um, my question is in relationship to cannabis. I live in a state where um, THC is not legalized, but we have Delta 8 versus Delta 9. And I think that might be helpful for people that are at home that will watch this recording. Is there a difference that you see for Delta 8 versus Delta 9? Because Delta 8 is available in the state that I live in, but Delta 9 is not. And um, I think it could be helpful for people to know if um, Delta 8 is equivalent or should they be cautioned using it, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, so Delta Eight uh, was was actually uh, uh, in wide use here in Minnesota, uh, and so Delta Eight um, is uh, again. I mentioned there are hundreds of different types of cannabinoids, and because we've done so little research, we've only identified a handful of them. So uh, essentially, Delta Eight does have very similar uh, uh, properties to THC. Um, it seems like, uh, and I. I I, again, I have to say most of my experience on this comes uh, from my patients um, who experiment with things. Um, and uh, uh, they do find that uh, many of my patients did find that uh, Delta-8 uh, was uh, was helpful. Um, it seemed in my experience 
uh, with them, at least it seemed like the, the um, Delta 8 probably didn't have as much, um, uh, didn't have as much of the cognitive, cognitive effects as THC, maybe a little less. Uh, and it almost seemed to work maybe a little bit better for pain. Some of my patients felt that it might have helped uh, them a little bit more for pain, almost like it had a little more CBD-like properties. But I just have to say that I'm fairly ignorant about the research on Delta-8 for therapeutic purposes. Uh, but in, from based on my patient's experience with it, uh, I believe that they have, uh, in general, yes, there is. Uh, it is reasonable to try Del Delta-8 if it is legal in your state. Um, I wouldn't quite know how to position it between like, you know, the way we use CBD versus THC. It seems to have kind of almost like little properties of each, uh, more so than the pure uh, uh, Delta-9 uh, THC. There's another type of Delta-9 THC, uh, THCA. Um, and, and then there's uh, some other different types of THCs that fly under the radar. I know Georgia's program allows a, I think it's THCA is not legal. Uh, or not illegal, um, and that has much more typical uh, THC properties, uh, more like a Delta-9 THC. It is a Delta-9, but THC-A. So it's, it's, it's crazy, and, and the rules between state to state are very different in what they restrict, so you really have to understand your state's rules. But if you have access to Delta-8, um, it's certainly worth a try. Again, I would say the same side effect issues, the same risk issues, the hyperemesis syndrome, uh, the other issues I mentioned before, the potential side effects also would apply to Delta-8 as well. All right, next question or comment or both. Uh, okay, so I'm not a pro in the field, but people need to know Delta-8 and 9 are synthetic products. Del Del okay, the Delta-8 is synthetic. You don't want to use synthetic products. Um, if it's legal, it's because an industry paid to get it legalized. Just look before you use any of those products. Now, I have another comment, but it's a whole different subject. So he might have a, okay. He's waiting for you. I, would, I mean, I would endorse that, that uh, the, the fact that we haven't been able to have the kind of typical research we would do, it being you know restricted at a federal level, um, I think has really hampered our understanding of all of these, th these different isomers and different types types, if you will, of cannabinoids. So yeah, it is, it really is buyer beware. You, you do, you do have to be careful. Well, and you should be afraid of synthetic things, you know, um, but anyway. I, yeah, I, you know, I have, I have a similar, I have a similar concern about that. I, I, I'm ignorant of whether it is, uh, uh, Delta-8 is isolated. I, I thought Delta-8 was isolated from, um, uh, um, hemp, but, uh, I may be wrong about that. Apparently I am you are um so um my other well we live in an area that uh in virginia uh we're in an area probably legalization would have never ever passed except it got attached to a bill during COVID, so it slid through because we weren't the likely state for that to happen in but i caution anybody about synthetics my other question the other thing i want to say is just a statement um i really i don't care what blood test is out there in my generation, I think we all need to be extremely careful about letting any age get put on disease-modifying treatments because, oh, yes, your point is right about the pharmaceuticals, but the uh, insurance companies would love for there to be an end to our disease-modifying drugs. So everybody needs to continue to fight. Don't let there be an age. I'm sorry, doctor, but there should not be an age put on when our disease-modifying drugs should ever mm -hmm. stop. Hmm. It needs to yeah. be on an uh, individual I, basis, just like it's been all along, because you know, you live in the real world. Insurance companies, hmm. they want to own it all, and right now they practically do. So we need to all be really careful and, and advocate for that. Thank you. By the way, yeah, you were I, talking, I, by I, the I way, really do doctor, doctor, this is Suzanne yeah. that was just speaking to you. She is uh, the founder of the Multiple Sclerosis Alliance of Virginia, and this is the company that mm -hmm. we support for their gallows each year. So. So, so Suzanne, um, I, I agree with you. Uh, it, it gives me great concern. Uh, we are uh, headlong rushing in, and, and some of my um, peers and, and colleagues have published uh, uh, data, published studies, uh, 
uh, where the conclusion seems to be recommending discontinuing treatment after a certain age. But I think if you really drill down on that, um, no, our biggest problem is this is, yes, we have identified that there are some people who probably don't need to be treated anymore, but we can't tell who those folks are ahead of time. And the only way to tell now is to take them off treatment. And if we did that in a blanket way to everybody, then we know a certain people are destined to be harmed by that. So I'm very excited about getting biomarkers and some additional tools that someday we will be able to use to be able to tell who does need to stay on treatment and who we might de-escalate, maybe go to a weaker treatment or maybe even discontinue. So, um, and even when I do that now, currently it's usually only for a reason. Often it's the patient's uh, uh, notion or cost is, is a big one, uh, sometimes side effect. And some of our um, more uh, highly efficacious therapies, especially ones that have more of a cumulative effect on your immune system, um, can, can cause greater harm, in, uh, greater immune suppression in older people. So we're aware of this kind of delicate balancing act that we want to uh, just treat the people who really need it. But right now we don't, can't clearly identify who needs it and who doesn't. And so then the real question becomes, should we just discontinue on everyone as perhaps the insurance industry might like us to do, um, which means a certain set of people are definitely gonna be harmed or should we be more selective? And we just don't have the tools to do that. These biomarkers might be one of the first wave of some tools that are gonna help us decide who really needs to be exposed to the risk and the cost of treatment going forward and who doesn't. I don't think we're there yet, but we're getting there and we're seeing baby steps in that direction. That for me is at least encouraging. Last question, last question of the night, all right? So are we going to be seeing a world that since they're going to say you're too old to be treated for MS, are we going to see a world where you're too old to be treated for cancer? Answer that one. Why can you be treated for cancer, but you can't be treated for MS? That, that's a, that is a no-go. Yeah, oh, at this you point, on the spot. I don't, I don't oh, my think gosh. that's where that's, – that's sorry, Stuart. Was there more question? I'm sorry, I can't no, see No, she was so, saying um, it's a valid question and she deserves an answer. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, so no, ab ab absolutely. I think, um, uh, well, first of all, comparing to cancer, um, I think insurance industry doesn't look at MS, doesn't look at a disabling disease. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying their perspective is they don't look at a disabling disease uh, in the same light that they look at a disease that kills people. Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, well, we can have our opinions about that. Uh, they have their the insurance industry seems to have their approach. Uh, the reality is that that no, um, uh, we have a very individual disease, just like cancer. Uh, you know, cancer isn't just one disease. There are numerous different types of cancers. And as I in, uh, the analogy I gave earlier, uh, where our my oncology colleagues are in being able to assess their disease state, divide it up and really study it in ways that allows them to know what treatments are going to be most effective for what types of cancers and staging and biomarkers, if you will, that they have for their disease state. So um, I agree with you that, uh, uh, no, we shouldn't not treat someone just because of their age. It should be really based upon their disease and do they really need treatment and what treatment do they need? I'm very hopeful and we may ultimately not um, be able to get there until we know or until we get to the point where we can have genetic biomarkers where you can say, all right, based on your genome, you need to be on this treatment and you still need to be on it. Uh, or maybe you need to be on a different treatment if you have a slightly different genetic variation. So I, I foresee a day, um, I'm not sure I'll still be practicing. I'm not sure I'll still be alive when that day comes, but I do foresee that day uh, that will help, will help us identify people with MS. Um, and hopefully, hopefully the science prevails rather than, you know, money and industry. I, I, I hear that undertone and I feel that as well. And it is painful to me to, to advocate for a patient 
that then gets lumped into a group and then treated as a group when I know that person's an individual. And we are constantly fighting with insurance companies over these artificial rules that they make that doesn't really have anything to do with the patient, has everything to do with their money. So I, I agree with you um, uh, in, in almost every aspect of what you said. I got one person to make a comment to you and then we're going to call it a night. All right. I don't know. I have a question for myself though. I, I don't know what she's going to say to you either. So, but you don't get the okay. microphone. <laughs> That's fine. I don't want you to hold it. So, um, um, okay. So you're speaking to a group of people living with MS and I guess in a way you're right, but to compare us to can to cancer kills, um, MS kills too. Um, I, I disagree completely with what you said. MS, I've seen MS kill more people than you must have a different breed of people than we have around I here. I think I think you misunderstood what I said. I really must have. Uh, yeah. So what I said is the insurance industry takes that perspective. So once again, there that, are enemies, and we you? need to. That work is not my perspective. That, I, my and perspective I hear you is loud and clear, but we all yes, need to I've really address that. Yes, I've seen this disease kill people. Yep. This disease shortens lifespan. I've had patients who have died from a relapse, a brainstem relapse. Uh, so no, I agree with you. Um, what I, my, my I was responding to a question related to uh, insurance perspective, and I was quoting what appears to be the insurance company's perspective is their pers when they're dealing with cancer as a diagnosis their rules seem to be different than when we're dealing, when we're struggling and fighting to get treatments for someone who's going to become more disabled and is losing brain cells to the disease. Um, and I struggle, I struggle to maintain every single last brain cell in every patient that I can. We fight for every neuron. And for me, uh, for me to be told by an insurance company that, oh, this patient can't have a strong drug cause, they have some rules in place for it? No. So, no, I am. Uh, I, I believe you completely misunderstood what I was saying. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I, yeah. I, day in, day out, am with persons with MS. I have been doing this a long time. I have seen what this disease does to people. So, uh, no, you did not understand what I said. Okay. What and I, I said okay. was the insurance company's perspective is that, oh, it's just a disabling disease. Uh, it's not going to kill you. And then we get different rules and regulations because people with MS are only going to be in a wheelchair. They're only going to lose cognitive function. They're only going to lose brain cells. So uh, I hope uh, that explanation uh, cleared up where I stand on this issue. Yes, and I thank you for that. And, and I hear you loud and clear. I think that probably the biggest thing is that you and Stuart and other people, especially doctors and leaders of clinics, that y'all remember we're tr we're looking up to you guys we're depending on you guys to defend these things for us and so please continue to do that because um there is as you said there is no comparison but we need y'all hard at work to battle these insurance companies all every day so thank you very much thank yeah, you Suzanne. I, I think if you understood just how much and maybe you do just how much effort we do put on on this every single day day in day out 60 to 70 percent of our efforts are not in taking care of our patients. It's 60 to 70 percent of our effort is being sucked away to jump through a bunch of hoops, check a bunch of boxes, do a bunch of things that someone in an insurance company decided needed to be done before they would pay for an important treatment. I, I worked with the MS Society here in Minnesota. We had a roadblocks to care initiative of how the insurance industry seems to just do everything they can, even just slowing down the approval of a drug results in harm to our patients, but the insurance industry makes money from that process. And personally, with someone, uh, uh, me and my team at the Shapiro Center, well, whoops, <laughs> the Shapiro Center moved to the Minnesota Center for MS, where <laughs> all of our team moved along with uh, Randy Shapiro's spirit. Um, but um, the Minnesota Center for MS, we are a comprehensive care center, and we fight tooth and nail day in, day out. Um, and a lot of the fight anymore is against the situation and the industry and uh, insurance companies. Um, and we'd like to be spending that time on taking care of our patients. So if there's anyone in government listening, hey, we need some rules. I want to thank Dr. Cockwood for all that he's done. Thank you.
And thank you, Stuart. So I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there. Um, uh, and uh, I hope that I'll get a chance and you'll invite me back and I want to be there for the whole thing. Um, I hear you guys put on a really, really big, really big shindig and I want to see it. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll, I'll get another opportunity to come in person. All right. Thank you again. All right. Good night, every, good night to Dr. Cockwood. Now we're going to have Ashley come on up. Open letter to this disease. Which one you silently contemplate? As you sit and listen, try not to pity my pain, my plight. It ain't a cakewalk, but this poem? This poem is intended to evoke curiosity, joy, elation over triumphs. These acronyms don't defy me today. I'm pushing against, resisting defeat, putting both feet on the floor, greeting the ground with each diaphragmatic inhale. I observe my breath as it gradually ascends past my ribs and into my chest. There's more room within my sternum than one would imagine, like an expansive cavern encapsulating my still beating heart, leaning into the hope. I wade my way through electrical impulses, misfiring neurons that attempt to demyelinate the fibers of my existence. The people? <laughs> you just wrapped it. The people? Oh my goodness. The people. That's what it's all about. Okay. Um, like an expansive cavern encapsulating my still beating heart. Leaning into the hope, I wade my way through electrical impulses, misfiring neurons that attempt to demyelinate the fibers of my existence. The people, the connection, that's what makes all this real, worth something, serves as my protection. I'm coming into a new, a comfort has arrived. Only took me a couple years with the daunting symptoms as symptoms and images of disability rattling around with my dreams held captive. But as they always say, time takes time. Time. What an illusory concept. However, the infamous they nailed the hammer on the head. As today, I am still standing and believe with the might of a mustard seed that I will continue to rise and fight for my life alongside my fellows, strangers, and loved ones alike. For it is my destiny. Colliers don't bend to the whims of adversity. Perseverance peels back the shadows cast from the harsh truths of this world. Once my father loosened the grip with which he clutched his demise and stared back at the emptiness, resilience became the name of our game. Is what my granny modeled her entire life and my father taught me. Bent and broken, we push through our tears because there's no other option. No passive way to float through life unscathed. I've been through the weeds time and time again. Kissed the darkness as it set up camp in my lonely backyard. And yet, I emerged from the all too familiar fog of disillusionment to always find the light. And today, I woke up with a mighty resolution for betterment. I'm strapped in for the ride. Like my sixth grade teacher, Miss Booker's familiar refrain, life, it's quite the roller coaster. I can still hear her voice and picture her wrinkled hand moving through the air like a calm wave or a gentle talisman, up and down and back up again. Despite my childlike dismissal of her wise words, they were melodic and they stuck. Yes, Miss Booker, there will be ups and downs. Thanks for the heads up. Thank you, have a good one, bye-bye.